When I'm not changing up the content on this channel to be more YouTube algorithm friendly, I like to answer questions that I get on YouTube, so let's get to it. Four nylon strings, what was used for strings on guitars? Example, Spain. Very interesting and specific question. I also didn't really know, so I actually did some research and what I found might shock you. So I'm gonna lessen the blow of this by voicing over the answer to a classical guitar piece that I just played. The answer is cat gut. Back in the early days of guitar, particularly classical and Spanish guitar, players would install strings made from dried lamb or bull intestines. The gut string making process had varied over the years, with much of its earlier development being in Europe. The process of making strings focuses on getting the intestines as clean as possible. Getting the excess fats away from the muscle tissue is cumbersome. Often the guts are soaked in water for many days and treated in ash water. Then the guts are stretched, scraped, and twisted. In the final stages of the process, they are bleached with a sulfur dioxide solution, dried, sanded, and treated with a final coating of olive oil. <laughs> Which brings us to reason number 500 million that anyone who's complaining about living in modern times is an absolute idiot. Kind of disgusting to think of stretched animal intestine as your guitar strings, but uh, that is the ugly truth of it. I guess tennis rackets, early tennis rackets were made of the same thing. You almost kind of have to tip your cap to the people back then who like saw that and was like, you know what? I bet I could totally make an instrument out of that dead animal intestine. So I for one, I'm a steel string fan. Nylon is great too, but just a little bit of a history lesson for you. Hey Sean, love your videos. I was wondering, do you set up your guitars or do you have someone do it for you? Mentioned this a few times before, total poser when it comes to setting up a guitar. My man Justin Mitchell, who I did the master class with and who I just did that Chase Bliss uh, mood demo with, really is the man when it comes to setting up my guitars. Eventually, I am going to become an adult and maybe set up my own guitars, and when that actually does happen, I'll probably do some videos about it and then act like I knew how to do it all along. All these lesson guys waste too much time on talking they don't need to do. Great majority of the salty comments are saying that it takes too much time to talk, and then other times, if you do less talking and you're playing, then you're just showing off because you're playing too much and you're not teaching. So I'm still looking for that perfect balance of saying just the right amount of words and playing just the right amount of notes to please absolutely everybody. I can't wait to get the next masterclass from you guys. I'm glad one is in the works, even if it's fingerstyle. I'm weak in that area, mostly because I don't practice it much. Well, you are in luck because probably in a couple weeks, I'm gonna release a masterclass I did with a friend of mine who's actually a legit professor in classical guitar. And it's not gonna be a classical guitar course so much as it's just kind of like a finger style, finger picking course. So uh, definitely stay on the lookout for that. And in the meantime, you can check out the other master classes I made with Ian on learning how to jam with confidence. And like I said with Justin, learning how to kind of just master the fretboard because all of them kind of build on each other. Never late, Irish Catholic, constantly self-loathing, it all adds up. And sorry, I don't believe Cry Baby Cry is your favorite Beatles song, Beyond Deep Cut. So last week I said the Cry Baby Cry is my favorite Beatles song, and I'm not saying that to be a contrarian, or I'm not saying that to try to be super cool, I just think I am super cool, and all the stupid radio hit Beatles songs don't quite do it for me in the way that Cry Baby Cry does it. Actually, I do love pretty much all the Beatles discography like a lot of musicians do. With one exception, incoming unpopular Beatles opinion, I cannot stand the song Hey Jude. <laughs> It's one of the most annoying songs in the world. Every time it gets to the big thing at the end, the big anthem that everybody chips in, I kind of want to die a little bit. So again, my contrarian nature really works both ways because I do like the Beatles. I legitimately like a lot of Beatles songs, but Hey Jude, I just can't get on board with. Sean would help to show how you mute strings to be able to strum them so clearly. So great question. I think a great way to practice it is by breaking a six string set into bands of two, right? So when I say that, if we just make like a C chord with the G in the bass, so three E, three A, two D, open G, one B, open E. And then if you really just kind of focus on just kind of palm mute hitting two strings at a time, I think that really helps with the stroke, which eventually will help being able to mute and cleanly pick really anything that you're going for, okay? So if you can get the E and the A string, and then the D and the G string, and then the B and the E string, That really kind of builds that muscle memory to be able to really kind of try to hit whatever string you're doing. One thing that I preach a lot is maybe like aiming for a root note. So I'm like kind of aiming for that A string 
in like a downward motion. And if I hit it, great. If I just come close, that's cool too, because with my fretting hand, I'm controlling the notes that I want to hit out. So you can kind of get a little bit of like a So you can kind of hear when I hit that. It's kind of like a dead end thing where you're just really coming down, but really training the attack over your pick lands into a more specific place. I think one cool exercise you can do with that chord is if you do hammer-ons on the D string, open two and G string, open two. Like that, because you're hearing the, the individuality of those strings in the context of a muted kind of pattern, right? So if we slow that down. So it's like a one and two and three and four and. The three and four and, the back of that bar is just gonna be straight up, just totally muted, right? So one and two and three and four and. So the one and is gonna be a downstroke and a hammer. The two and is just gonna be kind of like a sustained down up. And then the three and four and are muted. Which you'll notice that you'll you'll start to kind of get a little bit better at target practice instead of just hearing like a. When you hit all of the string set like that unmuted, you really can't get the hammer on to ring out as much. You can kind of hear it, but it's much better. It just sounds, you know, you, you, you're training your ears what to listen for, and then your strumming hand will start to cooperate with what you're going for. So I think if I understand your question right, that's kind of what I'm getting at, as far as just being more accurate with how your mutes come, how it's really a combination between a little bit of a palm mute with the picking hand, and a little bit of a selective uh, depressing and sustaining of the notes in your fretting hand. Honestly, it's one of those things that I didn't really even consciously practice. It's just being thoughtful and playing a lot. Again, really the answer to almost every question that I'm asked is just practice, just practice a little bit more. But uh, being thoughtful about it, and like kind of knowing what you're listening for is a great way for your hands just to kind of get the feel of it and improve. Cool lesson, thanks Sean. How do you get on buying guitars online? Do you trust you'll get a genuine model and not a counterfeit? Do they come set up and ready to play or do they need tweaking and setting up? Tuning excused, of course. Man, that's tough. I personally am somewhat terrified of buying used guitars online without getting a chance to play them first. Uh, I have kind of gotten burned a couple times. Countless stories of my friends getting burned a couple times. Again, I'm all about buying used for sure, but it's so much better if you can actually get your hands on one. I am by no means an expert in like spotting like a counterfeit guitar or something like that. But uh, regardless of whether it's authentic or not, being able to actually play a guitar and make sure there aren't like issues that you wouldn't be able to spot through pictures is a huge is a huge must for me personally. I know not everybody's in a situation where they kind of get access to a lot of guitars depending on where they live geographically, but it is something that I really, really stress. And uh, that's why I really hope that guitar shops are around for a long time, Guitar Center included, just because I think it's so valuable to be able to get your hands on one. And the varying degrees of setups for used guitars, I mean, is all across the board. But I will say something that I've noticed kind of in the last maybe 10 years and since I worked at Guitar Center is the setups coming from the factory and a lot of the models I'm super impressed with. I'm super impressed by the setups from the Fenders that I've been sent. Uh, Taylor, I still think, is best in class when it comes to acoustic guitars, uh, mass manufactured as far as like being set up. The Schecter that I just got, the Explorer that they sent me a few weeks ago, excellent setup right out of the box. The new Orangewood Sage really plays incredible. The action is fantastic right out of the box. All the D'Angelicos are really great. So that wasn't the case, uh, you know, 10 years ago, but I think they're making a lot of improvements. For listening homework this week, I'm gonna throw you to a band called Tennis, which has kind of a cool new school vibe. So check that out. And if you have any questions or comments, hit me up in the comment section, Instagram, Twitter, or the website. I'll talk to you all soon. Thanks a lot.